welcome to the Global Thought Podcast, brought to you by the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. The Committee on Global Thought, or CGT, crosses disciplinary boundaries and national borders to generate new approaches to address the challenges and realities of our world today, and also to imagine the world we want to create. I'm Vishaka Desai, Chair of the Committee on Global Thought and Senior Advisor for Global Affairs to the President of Columbia University. In this first episode of the second season, we welcome CGT member Bernard Harkel. Bernard is both a professor of law and professor of political science at Columbia University. And he also teaches in Paris. So we are delighted that right now he's actually in New York. He's also the director of Columbia Center for Contemporary Critical Thought and executive director of the Eric H. Holder Initiative for Civil and Political Rights. Today, we will be speaking with Bernard about his recently released book published by Columbia University Press, Critique and Praxis, which takes into account, in fact, his passion for both ideas and the action to create a more just and equitable society. Author of numerous publications, Bernard Harcourt is also a committed social justice litigator. Bernard, welcome. Thank you, Vishaka. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I am just thrilled that you will talk with us today. You are one of those rare individuals, which, as you argue in this book, should not be so rare in the academy, which is the very thesis of this book, Critique and Praxis. I wanted to ask you, you obviously have thought about this for a long time, and here is a book, a tome of almost 700 pages, um, much to think about, much to chew over. But what made you decide to actually do this book? And especially why now? It seems like the timing of the book is particularly relevant. So tell us why you felt the need to argue for this idea and action coming together. Thank you. Yes, it, it was it really was a product of these times, of these critical times. Um, it, it, it was it was during the elections, the 2016 elections, in fact, and the, and the results of those elections and the immediate aftermath uh, of those elections, in, including the, the Muslim ban, which was passed immediately upon President Trump's uh, inauguration, that I really felt that the, the weight of these crises crashing down on us, uh, global climate change, uh, uh, the, the war on terror, uh, the, the Muslim ban, which was a product of that, the years of kind of neoliberal reg regimes across the world, of course. And all of that just felt so pressing. And, and somehow it felt that our academic interventions were not sufficiently productive that somehow we had been we we'd been we'd been working on these issues there's no doubt many of us had been working on climate change many of us had been working on on on, on, on questions of fascism and, and neoliberalism but it just felt after the election in 2016 that we we weren't doing enough i, I felt i wasn't doing enough and and i was I, I myself am dedicated to many of these issues and have spent decades working on them. And somehow it just became clear to me that um, we somehow we had started to spin our wheels. Somehow it felt as if all of this work wasn't coming to fruition. Somehow it felt as if we weren't having the intended effect. And it was it was at that moment that I really started questioning actually some of my projects, some of my own academic projects. Um, in the wake of the 2016 election, so many of my own academic projects felt as if I had gone down the wrong path or had um, started to spin my wheels and that it wasn't having the intended effect. And so it was really that sense of urgency um, that, that gave birth to this book. 
I mean, I think to some extent, it seems to me what you're saying is what often the world beyond the academy has accused the academy for off. And that is, you're spinning your wheels, you are thinking to yourself, you are parsing words, but you are actually not helping people to figure out what to do in the world. And so that notion of criticality, and you really spend a great deal of time thinking about the origin of critical philosophy, and that go back to Marx to say, it was to critique in order to change the world. So somehow it seemed like that to change the world part got dislodged from critiquing the world to understand the world for its own sake. You know, it seems to me that um, what you're talking about for those of us who have been in the non-academy and then coming back to the academy uh, to kind of say, gee, there's something missing here. And that's, it sounds to me, what you're talking about. So how did it happen that with critical philosophy, especially as you write so eloquently, that it began with critiquing to make a difference? So to make a difference got kind of dislodged from the critique part. And you also write about going back to the Greek philosophers that actually understood that thinking and doing, and then of course the third leg, which interests me a great deal about making the artistic imagination, that these were three legs of a stool of the society, that somehow they got dislodged from one another, as it's also true in the art making world, you know. So how did that happen, that especially in critical philosophy, that we kind of moved away or philosophy professors, philosophers moved away? Not always so, but it seems like in the last 40, 50 years, things have changed a bit. So what happened? Right. Well, so Marx plays a big role here um, in in the work uh, and 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 the and the decline of Marxism really and or the the the, the loss of faith in kind of Marxian thought. Um, so he, it plays a big role, as you were suggesting, because I, I trace the origin of the critical impulse, the, in the origin of critical philosophy, to that move in the 19th century uh, to not just interpret the world, uh, but to change it, right? And, and, and so um, the term critical philosophy is a, is a complicated term. It's generally associated with Kant and his three critiques, critique of pure reason and of practical reason and, and of aesthetic judgment. Um, and oftentimes we think of critical philosophy as being the tradition of critique that started with Kant. But what I try to suggest is actually that within Kantian thought itself, there were these two strands, two separate tr strands, which, and only, only one of which really uh, is the one that we are working in today, something about how uh, uh, we have to explore the conditions of possibility of today. And what I suggest is that instead of tracing critical philosophy to Kant, we really need to trace it to the 19th century and to Marx's determination to make philosophy uh, uh, practical in a sense, material, uh, and that's the critical impulse. Now, throughout the ages or throughout most of the rest of the 19th and most of the 20th century, critical theory then became associated with Marxism in a way. But of course, that eclipsed uh, around around the 1960s and, and, and has eclipsed today. And so the question is whether it's possible to retain the impulse of trying to change the world with a critical perspective that no longer really has the, the Marxist theory of, of history and of the uh, proletariat at its heart anymore. So is it possible to retain that desire to turn thought critically into action, right? Letting go of the of the Marxist piece and, and of Marxist theory. Um, and that's what I try to offer in this book, something that that lets go of 
that philosophy of history, let's go of notions of the proletariat, which are no longer applicable today. I mean, we deal with, with race, we deal with ethnicity, we deal with gender, etc. Indeed, as I was going through the book, one feels that when you're talking about critical philosophy, that there is a certain radicality to that idea. And sometimes that radicality goes back to Marx. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that how, and at the same time, the critique of Marx, one would say, is that it's too focused on material condition mm -hmm. of our world. Whereas today, we have to look at some broader things. So what you, it seems to me what you're saying is that we got to liberate critical philosophy also from its Marxist, uh, Leninist kind of idea, because it also gave us some disastrous consequences in terms of action. Right, right. And, and those and those disasters are what created resistance to praxis. In other words, if one, I mean, if one thinks about this over the 20th century, really the idea of merging critique and praxis, that that got dislodged predominantly because of the catastrophes of revolutionary projects that were originally I idealist and utopian, but that backfired so terribly, right? So Stalinism and, and certain forms of, um, of the Cultural Revolution, et cetera, that, that, that chastened us in a way, chastened us critical thinkers, all of a sudden made us a little bit more cautious, a little bit less willing to engage in the thinking around praxis. And so the, the, the idea of this book is somehow to retain the impulse, but to, but to, understand, but to understand it differently today, and also to, 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 to adjust it to our contemporary context and situation. You mentioned Lenin, for instance, right? Very important. And, and for a long time, I, I was styling the question as, you know, what is to be done, which of course traces back to, right. you know, uh, 1917. But I, I realized that we can't even ask that question anymore properly right. in, in the same way, right? And so- yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting, actually, because I kept coming back to what is to be done mm -hmm. and what more can I do, which is sort of one of the ways that you have a rallying cry through the book. And at the same time, at least one feels in the academy, the minute you say what is to be done sounds as if you are instrumentalizing knowledge. And that phrase also has a certain level of almost negative connotation that why do we always have to think about what is to be done? Why can I not just say what is to be thought? And that my job is to create this thinking epistemological framework, then others will take it where they will. So why would you say that it is not enough? Why? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, you've, you've put your finger on kind of one of the, the greatest uh, deficiencies of theoretical and, and theoretical work and of the academic space, which is this disjuncture, that moment after someone has fully theorized, critiqued, offered something very rich about the contemporary world and 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 the interlocutor asks, okay, so what do we do about it? Right. And and that moment is the juncture between, in some sense, typically in, in the academy, it's a juncture between this rich analysis, multi, multi-dimensional, uh, multidisciplinary, just kind of you everyone is so caught by the brilliance of all of this thinking. And then Bam. The next question is, what do you do about it? And all of a sudden, it feels as if we're all flat footed. Right. And we're offering these proposals and, and suggestions that, you know, that that are that are simplistic. And you've lost all of the you've lost all of that richness in that moment. Right. And it's a constant. It, it always happens. It always happens in a paper, in a workshop. There's always this moment. Well, OK, well, let's, let's pivot to, you know, what is to be done? We, and, and all of a sudden, everybody looks it feels as if everybody like it feels as if 
all of the brilliance evaporates, right? right? And now we're we're with the plumbing. We're back in the plumbing. I mean, but the problem is exactly that, that we privilege thinking for the sake of thinking so much that we actually, when we suggest something or somebody else suggests something, it feels like, oh, really? This is so simplistic. It is not brilliant enough because we privilege the mind in a way that as if the exercising that muscle is in itself good enough, but not to actually say, to what end? Why? Why does it matter? To whom does it matter? And it's sort of, and I find this even in the class, we just had a session with the CGT students on environment. And we had brilliant people, they really were analyzing the words, and they were suggesting big ideas of what needs to be done. And these young people are saying, yes, this is very good. But what now? What are you going to do? Five years from now, where are you going to be? And the professors were like, "Uh, I know, but you know, that's not what I do well. Now, that in itself seems like a good acknowledgement to say, I have not exercised that part of praxis enough to be able to give good answers, then figure out what is the next. And that's where you come in. Yeah, right. But but I think that where we come in is to turn the praxis questions into those rich questions that we generally deal with under the rubric of critique. In other words, in other words, what we need to do is to not view these as two separate spaces where we're doing the thinking and then we're doing the acting, but to but to 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 constantly confront action, uh, our own, and also our ideas of what we should be doing with critical thought. So, and so in, in the book, what I propose is I, I, I moved away from the uh, expression, what is to be done, um, and, and, and replaced it for this age, because I believe it just doesn't fit anymore. What is to be done is too much telling other people what to do. It's 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 uh, it it doesn't respect uh, who is heard, who has the speech, who gets listened to, and so I've tried to replace that completely with the question, you know, what more am I to do? Uh, so that it's a really self-reflexive analysis. But I realize that when I do that, I also am more able to then confront uh, my own actions with critical theory and 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 to confront critical theory with my own actions. In other words, it becomes a much more, a much richer analysis of praxis because I am in effect confronting my praxis, which itself is in it in, in less of a way, it's not so much, it's it's not it's not as simplistic because it's not as if I'm saying you you one needs to do this, you need to do this, which it's actually the things that I am doing, right? And those, of course, are very embedded and very rich and multidimensional and related to the critical thoughts I'm having and whatnot. And it's that bringing together, that confrontation. It's also owning your own action, behavior, and thinking. So that actually brings me to the next question, and that is that you have represented the death row prisoners. You have been a solicitor. You have worked with the laws, the immigration laws that were affecting people and stopping them at the airport. So describe for me and for the read, um, here listeners, how did you actually bring all your amazing brilliance and critical thinking to bear on those actions. And I think that that way one can, and I completely get this because as having been a museum curator, director, blah, 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 and then coming back into the academy, I always felt that I desisted the idea that ideas and objects were so separate. And that ideas and theories and presentations were to be separate. 
And at the same time, it is a lot of work, but it only can be done personally. So I want to know how you went about doing that. Right. Well, in, in, in part, this book, I mean, this book does have an auto, not biographical, but auto a reflective, a deep reflective part in it, which, um, which I often wanted to get rid of, but ultimately, but, but, well, I'll explain why, but so it was a, a deep reflection of my own practice over the years, which is, which has changed and my own struggles really more than my own practice, my own struggles over how to practice, because as someone who has represented persons on death row for 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 three decades i've i've always struggled with this you know with representing you know with with the way in which one gets caught up in in one case and and spends so much time in one case and and feels all of a sudden that you're just part of the part of the system in a way you're you're a cog caught up in the system you know and all of my work was down in alabama where where i started uh, representing people on death row but so, uh, even when i was down there uh living and working in montgomery after after 3 4 years i started to feel well, now wait a minute you know i i've i've just become part of this system and 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 those conflicts of how to practice how, what to do what to do so as not to be facilitating and legitimating the system but challenging it but also representing someone and 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 trying to save their life um it's those struggles that made me realize actually that i was it was actually I was struggling with the relationship between critical theory and praxis at at that time without even realizing it in a way, because all of these questions of legitimation and am I legitimating the system or not? Right. That's 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 critique. That's what critique is all about. Right. I was just talking to somebody else and I think one of the big thing is reflection, self-reflection, which is kind of a critique. And it's not a critique of a thing outside of yourself, but the critique of yourself in action and in thinking that then lends itself to more reflective and considered action as you go forward. And it's so much richer in that way than than simply talking about what others should do, because you've got your you've got your own action as this embedded, historically situated theoretical object I mean, I mean it's more than just a theoretical object obviously but it is the outgrowth of all of your critical thinking i mean you're acting in relationship to your critical thinking and so you're you know it's it's about you know why did i take this case why did i why did i challenge the muslim ban what and was that was that useful what was i doing how how did that help right or 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 how 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 come I, so I, I have a, a Guantanamo uh, a person who's on Guantanamo representing someone on Guantanamo? How does that work? What is the relationship to that and to the challenge and to the trying to change the world? How does that function in that way? That becomes a very rich, multi-dimensional, critical kind of confrontation of what we think about the world, how it's how it's organized, and 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 what are our crises that we face today, but also what am I doing? What more can I be doing? And it's and and, and somehow, I I've I've come to the conclusion that it's it's a that's constant confrontation. It's not actually uh, some some critical theorists, like Horkheimer and uh, and Adorno, but others as well. Marcuse especially um, uh, had talked about the unity of theory and practice and um but uh, and but it also talked at the same time in some kind of hegelian conflictual way of the contradictions between theory and practice and and i've come to the point where it's actually in the confrontation it there isn't it's not a you there isn't a unity there is a constant clashing confronting right. that is productive yeah so it doesn't go from the dialectic to synthesis it is just perpetual confrontation right. at all times. Right. Um, well, I mean, you know, one of the things that I was interested in was also that the book very much argues for that idea of the space where things, they don't come together per se, but they must actually be in the same plane. Um, 
And at the same time, if one were to ask you as to who the book is written for, and the reason I say that is that often for, and, and you comment that as well, that in fact, um, when Foucault says, this book is not written for readers, it's written for doers. Um, and I was kind of thinking about the fact that how much the doers feel like they don't have the luxury of thinking. Okay. Thinkers feel like they have all the luxury, but they don't have to do the doing. So who is this written for? You know, um, it's, that's, that's a great question because um, the, the real answer, to tell you the truth, is that it's really written for my, my, my students, my, for the younger generations who seem to really be asking this question. In a way, um, uh, it's you know, I mean, it's it, it is seven hundred pages. It, it's got some philosophy in it. There are some sections that probably could have been better written for a more general audience. Uh, so it is a specialized. It, it it is in in a sense a specialized book in a way. Um, but the 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 people who I feel are most Interp who I'd like to interpolate most with this book are my students who are asking this precise question, who are asking the question of, 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 um, of, of how does all of this critical theory function and, and how, can I, how can I act uh, and, and what more should I do? So uh, that, that is, that is I'm, I'm mostly interested in 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 because I, I I feel a real thirst a real and 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 I myself am deeply inspired uh, when I hear the stories uh, from and, and listen to the experiences and see the lives of um, my students who are mostly implicated in political struggle today. Um, uh, I mean, I just spent you know uh, this morning I was editing a I was editing an essay. All about uh, the abolition of the police uh, by by uh, by a student and and and, and friend and colleague um, who who was a, who was arrested last night and who is yeah. confronting this question of police abolition in the wake of the most recent police shooting in Philadelphia, uh, Mr. Wallace Jr. And so it's it's that and 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 I sense this real urgent need. To understand, you know what, how to act politically, but how our actions or how their actions of the younger generations can be understood, enriched, uh, motivated, inspired, etc., by the confrontation with theory. I, I feel in, in a certain way that I have spent my life dedicated to the mission of trying to bring together the the mind and action to bring together critique and praxis and 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 i feel as if this is a moment when particularly younger generations are deeply confronting that issue you know you would be so happy to know that one of our cgt students who is now applying for a phd in political science and she's struggling with this issue because she is of Arab origin, Canadian, very involved with immigration issues in different places. And she said, but I'm really looking for people who actually believe this, that it's possible to do both. And I said, you must read this book. And I told her that she should actually apply to Columbia. And of course, we're not taking any PhD students for next year, which is a different problem. Um, however, how amazing that you should say that you're really writing it for the students because she was right there looking for people that she can work with. So I must say, I want to thank you for this amazing short conversation. We could go much, much longer, but I know that you also have much to do. But I want to thank you for joining us and let our listeners know that the book is published by Columbia University Press and it is available 
from the university press. So thanks, Bernard, and much more to say and to do. And I look forward to what your next thinking and acting is going to look like. Thank you, Shaka, so much. Thank you.